I'm the Education Program Manager for Communicating Contraceptive Risk, and I will just be moderating the session. So um, welcome to our first part of a two-part series, Communicating Contraceptive Risk. So just some reminders, to receive continuing education credit for this activity, you must take the pre and post test. If you have not yet taken the pre-test and you are viewing this webinar, you will find the pre-test link in your reminder email, and the post link will be sent to you after the webinar. If you are viewing this webinar on demand, both the pre- and post-test links can be found below this video. In the webinar dashboard, you should see a chat box that you can use to enter questions throughout the webinar. We will answer these questions at the end of the webinar. Um, anything we don't get to, we can always respond to at a later time. So in four weeks, you will receive an email from ARHP's education department with a link to a follow-up evaluation. We ask that you complete this evaluation to let us know how you have incorporated what you've learned during this webinar into your work. Completing the pre and post test as well as the follow-up evaluation helps ARHP ensure we continue to meet your educational needs and interests. Thank you in advance for your time and feedback. At this time, I would like to introduce our faculty uh, presenter, Dr. Jackie Katal. Uh, Jackie Katal is a family nurse practitioner working in a gynecology office in Portland, Oregon. She is a co-founder of NSSRH and served on its board for 10 years. Her passion is in treating adolescents and talking about sexuality with patients. She has been educating others in the area of sexual health for about 20 years. Jackie loves solving vaginal and uterine mysteries, salsa dancing, and exploring the world with her husband and toddler. We're thrilled to have her with us today, and without further ado, I'll hand it off to Jackie. Hi, everybody. I just want to let you know I'm not a doctor. I'm a nurse practitioner, as um, Doris introduced me as Dr. Jackie Kital, but I'm just Jackie, so hello, everybody. Next slide. So um, I'm one of the faculty presenters. You can see my um, cute picture there, <laughs> um, and uh, this is a... Uh, with a grant from Merck is how we're doing this presentation, and I'll try my best to fly through so that I can respect your time since we started late. Next slide. Um, you can see that I have nothing to disclose. Next slide. So the learning objective. By the end of this activity, you'll be able to define absolute risk, attributable risk, relative risk, and odds ratio, talk to patients about these risks, and um, figure out how to say these things so that patients can understand them well. Next slide. So why is it important to communicate effectively about contraceptive risks and benefits? Almost half of pregnancies in the U.S. are unintended, about 45% based on some data in 2011, and that statistic really hasn't changed for a long time. It's starting to budge down um, in the last couple of years, but it's still about 50%, so that's a lot. Um, almost half of unintended pregnancies each year in the U.S. occur in women who are using contraception. However, 95% of those occur in young women or in women who are either not using contraception or using it less than less than effectively. So, only 5% of unintended pregnancies occur in women using contraception correctly and consistently. And consistently, I'm sorry. Next slide. So, the main benefit of birth control. Next slide is the avoidance of unintended pregnancy. Approximately two-thirds of women at risk for unintended pregnancies are consistent user users of birth control, as seen in the graph on the left. Yet birth control users only make up about 5% of women who have unintended pregnancies, showing that birth control users are less likely to have unintended pregnancies. The majority of unintended pregnancies occur in non-users and inconsistent users of birth control. It is important to note that unintended pregnancy is strongly correlated with low income levels. Next slide. Reducing unplanned pregnancy can reduce risk to the mother in terms of mental health and mother-child relationship quality. Contraception also reduces pregnancy risk, which is particularly important for adolescents and patients with chronic health conditions. Unintended pregnancy is associated with worse, worse outcomes for the infants, including lower birth rate, preterm delivery, and increased risk exposure during the perinatal period. When counseling women about the risks of unplanned pregnancy, please be sure to acknowledge that not all unplanned, unplanned pregnancies are unwanted. Next slide. Both oral contraceptives and IUDs and implants decrease the overall risk of cancer. In particular, they reduce ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and colon cancer. Heavy menstrual blood is reduced by most types of contraception. IUDs perform better than um, combined oral contraceptives, and from now on, instead of combined, instead of saying combined oral contraceptives, I'm going to say COCs. Um, so IUDs perform better than COCs, but all contraception helps. 
endometriosis symptoms, ovarian cysts, and acne are also reduced by contraception. It is important to keep in mind that these benefits do not apply to all types of birth control. For example, ovarian cysts are reduced by moderate doses of COCs, but not low doses of COCs. Next slide. A meta-analysis included 10 studies and calculated the pooled adjusted odds ratio of 0.54. Thus, women with an IUD had a risk of endometrial cancer that was 46% lower than that of women without an IUD. These studies include both the copper di the, the study has included both a copper IUD and a hormonal IUD. There is sufficient evidence to determine differences in protective effects against endometrial cancer between different types of IUDs. Researchers have proposed the following possible mechanisms for the protective effect. One, an intense inflammatory response triggers inflammatory actions, possibly including the elimination of hyperplastic endometrial epithelial cells. Or, there could be a more complete shedding of the endometrium using these methods, which may decrease hyperplasia of the endometrium and um, decreases your risk for endometrial carcinoma. When counseling patients about IUDs and endometrial cancer risks, clinicians should not oversell the benefits of IUDs. While hormonal and non-hormonal IUDs have been linked to a reduced risk of cancer, a variety of factors can reduce the risk reduction. Um, both recent use, within one year, there's a 61% decrease, and longer duration of use, more than 10 years, where there's a 39% decrease, are associated with risk reductions. Next slide. So let's talk about how we talk to patients about this. So a risk is defined as a danger or hazard. Uh, sorry, next slide. Um, also the probability of suffering harm. Harm includes both significant risks and side effects. Note that some side effects can be perceived as significant by patients. In addition, some patients may consider certain side effects, like their period being lighter, to be positive. Next slide. To get a sense of the probability of suffering harm, certain risk calculations are used. These are some commonly used risk calculations that you should understand as you discuss risks associated with various contraceptive methods. So first, absolute risk. Absolute risk is the same as incidence and provides the rate of occurrence of a condition or, di or disease in a population group exposed to a specific hazard, infection, trauma, or other event. Relative risk is the probability of one event, or sorry, of an event in one group divided by the probabil probability of the, that event in another group. It reflects the relative likelihood of developing the outcome. Importantly, relative risk must be calculated using incidence rates. Which, require, which requires a prospective study design. Odds ratio is similar to relative risk. It is the ratio of odds of one event in one group divided by the odds in the other group. Relative risk can be calculated for cohort studies because the underlying incidence of the condition under the study is known. For example, we know the incidence of the unexposed group. For case-controlled studies, an underlying incidence is unknown, and so relative risk cannot be calculated, and instead an odds ratio is used. Next slide. So absolute risk is calculated by summing the total number of events divided by the total number of people at risk over the exposure time. The absolute risk of pregnancy can be calculated by determining the total number of women who experience pregnancy while using a contraceptive method over the course of one year and dividing it by the total number of women and the population who could become pregnant. Contraceptive efficacy is often expressed in women years. Relative risk is calculated by dividing the incidence of an event in one group divided by the incidence of events in another, in another group. The odds ratio is similar, but uses probability instead of incidence. Next slide. So here's an example of the difference between absolute and relative risk. The baseline risk of thrombosis in general population of women is very low at 1.9 events per 10,000 years. In women receiving oral contraceptives, the risk increases to 6.7 events per 10,000 years. While the absolute risk for users is still very low, there's an increase. To calculate the relative risk, or the value of the increase in absolute, in absolute risk, the rate of events observed in users of COCs is divided by the rate of events in the general population. So this would be 6.7 divided by 1.9. The result, this results in an, a relative risk of 3.5. So we say that, in the, in the way of saying the people that use COCs have an increased risk of, risk of, thromb of thrombosis of 350% greater. So you can see that that sounds really scary um, and using absolute risk 
makes it sound a little bit um, more realistic and maybe might be more understandable um, because people don't always know the way that we're doing these calculations and saying something is 300 350% more risky versus 6.7 users of COCs versus 1.9 users of non-COCs would have a thrombotic event might be easier for people to understand. Next slide. So the risks related to contraception. Next slide. The most common side effects of COCs are breakthrough bleeding, amenorrhea, bloating, nausea, and breast tenderness. Many patients who experience headache, uh, sorry, many patients also experience headache, which is a commonly cited use for dis cause for discontinuation. Breakthrough bleeding is most commonly caused by missed pills. For patients who receive an IUD or an implant, breakthrough bleeding may last for up to the first year. For most patients with IUDs with an implant, spotting goes away after three to six months. Cramping and back pain are common for IUDs for the first few weeks after initial insertion, and the copper IUD may lead to heavier bleeding. Importantly, weight gain is not convincingly associated with COC use, although many patients cite that as the reason um, to discontinue their method. Research suggests that weight gain is actually a consequence of getting older. Next slide. Hormonal contraceptives are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. It is believed that this is due to estrogen content. Estrogen is a transcriptional regulator and it decreases the plasma concentration of clotting factors through upregulation of transcription. There's a small increased risk of myocardial infarction, infarction hypertension, and ischemic stroke. High-dose estrogen contraception carries a higher risk than low-dose contraception, and in this particular study, low-dose estrogen or low-dose contraception was considered to be 20 micrograms, and high-dose estrogen was between 30 and 40 micrograms. Next slide. Combination hormonal contraceptives increase the risk of uh, venothromboembolism, and for now, instead of saying venothromboembolism, I'm going to say VTE. <laughs> So increase the risk of VTE by approximately three to five-fold. However, it's important to note that substantial increase in VTE observed in pregnant women and postpartum women well exceeds the risk for COC users. Among all contraception, COCs containing levonorgestrel have the lowest VTE risk. It's important to note that the risks of VTE and other cardiovascular morbidity or mortality increase in women with certain medical conditions, such as a history of stroke or clotting disorders. For some women, the risks of cardiovascular events, um, adverse events, do outweigh benefits of certain types of contraception, and so you have to figure that out. Go ahead and uh, next slide. The type of progestin used in COCs may affect the VTE risk. Many studies have shown that the VTE risk, oh, um, uh, sorry, the VTE risk is increased for third generation COCs, as well as the anti-androgenic progestins. Um, like, for example, YAS. Nonetheless, the absolute risk of VTE remains low across all progestin types, um, and so it's something that we should think about, but not necessarily worry too much about because it's not statistically, statistically significant. Next slide. In this study, over 46,000 women were observed for up to 44 years and divided into an ever or never users of COCs. Oral contraceptives non-significantly non increased the lifetime risk for invasive cervical cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma. Looking at the absolute risk, it can be seen that the increase in risk for the rare invasive cervical cancer and melanoma is relatively small. For the more common breast cancer, the absolute risk is already high in non-users, and it's not increased significantly by adding birth control to it. Importantly, contraceptives also significantly decrease the lifetime risk of colorectal, ovarian, and endometrial cancer. Overall, the result is a modest, not significant decrease in risk for all types of cancer in ever users of COCs. Breast cancer, which is the most common cancer observed, was very close to no effect at an odds ratio of 1.04. So the significant increase in risk for breast and cervical cancers appeared to be lost after about five years of stopping a COC, which is why there's still a non-significant increase in risk for ever users of COCs. In contrast, the benefits seen in endometrial, ovarian, and colorectal cancer prevention persisted for up to 30 years after following the cessation of COC use. Next slide. 
Data on hormonal contraceptives and breast cancer are inconsistent. Multiple prospective studies have shown no risk or a moderate but insignificant increase slightly. Um, studies that indicate a significant increase in risk are usually shorter term studies, have smaller sample sizes, or are less well controlled. Next slide. There is some evidence that the conflicting studies in the literature about hormonal contraception and breast cancer are related to the different formulations of oral contraceptives. In a case control study of over 1,000 women, recent COC use was significantly linked to breast cancer. However, when the women were stratified by COC formulations, low-dose estrogen COCs, which was the most commonly prescribed first-line COC, was not associated with increased risk in breast cancer. Other formulations, such as high-dose estrogen pills, or triphasic COCs were associated with a much higher odds of breast cancer. In another study comparing hormonal IUDs with non-hormonal IUDs, no difference in breast cancer risk was noted between these two populations. And this is important to note because other studies have compared hormonal users with the general population and found an increased risk of breast cancer. However, many have pointed out that the hormonal IUDs were used for women experiencing heavy bleeding who may have had other risk factors for breast cancer that the general population did not have. Both ACOG and the CDC endorse the use of COCs in patients with a history of breast cancer or with BRCA mutations. The use of hormonal contraceptives before 30 years of age and for more than five years in duration increases the risk of breast cancer in women with BRCA1 mutation, but not with the BRCA2 mutation. However, the reduced risk of ovarian cancer is thought to outweigh the small increase of risk for breast cancer. So ACOG indicates that COCs provide good benefit for patients with BRCA mutations. Next slide. That was a mouthful. Sorry about that. So um, COCs is often associated with an increased risk, risk of cervical cancer. This correlation is associated with the duration of COC use. As duration increases, so too does the risk of cervical cancer. This increases risk, uh, risk is irreversible following the discontinuation of COCs. Some studies have shown that HPV negative users of COCs are not at an increased risk of cervical cancer. This may be related to pro-oncogenic effects of the HPV combined with transcriptional effects of the metabolite of estradiol. In studies that controlled the risk for HPV, Testing was not always performed at regular intervals, which is why it is still unknown whether HPV status is associated with contraceptive-related risk of cervical cancer. Next slide. Oh, sorry, there's a little pop down at the bottom. Uh, next slide. The 2016 CDC medical eligibility, oh, sorry, can you go back one slide? Thank you. Um, the 2016 CDC medical eligibility criteria chart compares birth control types and gives recommendations based on patient conditions. This is a super handy chart to have, and if you didn't know about this, it's really, really great. It talks about every particular thing you could think of as far as medical problem and then all the types of birth control and if you should use them or could use them or not. Um, so the ratings are between a one and a four. A one is, you know, very safe and four is do not use. Um, next slide. So the app is really great. It's very convenient um, because you can just type in either the medical condition or the type of birth control and then slide through and check and see if your patient could use a method that they wanted to use. So it's a really handy app and it's um, free to download. Next slide. So several conditions increase the risk um, of cardiovascular events, or I'm sorry, poor, uh, poor outcomes. Uh, these, many of these conditions are cardiovascular in nature and increase the risk of a thrombotic event. Patients should be encouraged to consider other forms of contraceptive when presenting with these particular conditions. Next slide. There are three types of emergency contraception. Many patients are unaware of the existence of emergency contraception, how to access it, and how it works. This is detrimental to patients who do not wish to become pregnant as it may deter youth. Patients should be counseled on the risks and benefits of these methods. And I think, especially as a clinician, it's important to make sure that people understand that emergency contraception does not cause abortion. I think that's the number one reason people say to me that they don't want to take it, and that's because they don't understand how it works. Next slide. This table puts into perspective the risk of death associated with oral contraceptives. For example, from a VTE or stroke, 
compared with the risk associated to some other types of contraception and some other types of things that could happen to you. For example, you can see that automobile driving is down at the bottom for comparison. So out of 100,000 people, the chance of death in one year is 20 people that are driving a car versus 30 out of 100,000 non-smoking oral contraceptive users between the age of 35 and 44. Next slide. So let's talk about how we talk about this with patients. <laughs> so remember these basic principles to communicate effectively. Establish and maintain a rapport with a, with a client or the patient. Assess the patient's needs and personalize discussions accordingly. Work with the patient actively to establish a plan and provide information that can be understood and retained by the patient. Confirm that the patient understands. Um, I like the part here talking about remembering to establish a plan because the patient may decide that they want to take the pill, for example, but we all know that if you take the pill, it's most effective if you take it at the same time every day. And so making a plan with that patient and saying, hey, it looks like you chose the pill, and I just want to remind you that you have to take it at the same time every day. What kind of things can you do to help you remember? And then coming up with a plan and making sure the patient can do that plan is a really good part of the counseling, and it will help you feel like you've done your job, and it'll help the patient be empowered to understand how to use the method correctly. Next slide. So what makes for effective communication about contraceptives? Um, so you can see that there's a huge list of things to do and don't do. <laughs> so basically, you do want to help them choose what's best for them and come to this without any preconceived notions or judgments. Um, and you don't want to direct women about what you think would be best for them or assume that the most important thing to them is to become to avoid pregnancy because that may not be the most important thing to them. Um, it may be that they want to decrease their blood flow or see their period. Um, so just make sure that you're not automatically assuming something about the method that they might decide to choose. Next slide. So active listening is an important skill for eliciting a woman's preference and values regarding contraception. Even in a busy schedule, it's important to pause and listen, ask for clarification, and use follow-up questions as needed. Is she concerned about spotting, weight gain, amenorrhea? Does she desire pregnancy in the near future? Um, asking about preferences as well as concerns can help ensure a better contraceptive choice for each woman and save time in the long term. Go ahead and next slide. Employ the teach back method to demonstrate that the patient understands what to expect with the use of a method. The teach back method asks a patient pointed questions to verify that essential information is in process. Here are some examples of questions you may want to ask clients about their contraceptive method. So, you know, I usually say something like, I want to be sure that I did a good job explaining it to you. Can you remind me again how you should take this method? Or um, I want you to remember, I want you to remember the side effects that you might experience with this method. Can you tell me about how long you think you might have irregular bleeding after we put this IUD in? So they can help kind of remember that three months from now that irregular bleeding is still okay. Next slide. According to the Informed Medical Decisions Foundation, shared decision making is a collaborative process that allows patients and providers to make health care decisions together. It takes into account the best clinical evidence available, as well as the patient's values and preferences. Shared decision making is not a goal. The goal is better health decisions to achieve outcomes that matter to the patient. And shared decision making is a way to reach that goal. It's a great tool um, for any health decision with more than one medically reasonable option, which is generally the case for most contraceptives and a lot of other things, to be honest. Um, decision aids are educational materials written for patients that describe risks, benefits, and potential consequences of all the options. And these are often used to help facilitate a conversation. Next slide. There are three steps um, to do this. So first of all, you're gonna introduce options. Make sure that the patient knows all the reasonable options that are available. The second step is to describe the options and tell them the details about particular method they might be interested in. And the third step is to just support, support the patient deciding what they want to choose. Um, so you can see here this kind of uh, uh, script that you could use, something like, if reversibility is important to you in the future, here are the options for contraceptives. And then you can talk about the options that are reversible. Um, and you can say, are there any other questions? Do you want me to tell you anything more about that? And they could help you let, let you know what's been on their mind or what's concerning them about that issue or that option. Next slide. 
One caution about advice giving, patients' desire to be actively engaged in decision making exists along with along a spectrum. And some patients will want their care provider to share their personal opinion, saying something like, I'm not sure what would you choose. And it's important for you to avoid the trap of saying what you believe to be the best method for the patient. For example, stating most effective methods are best. How about I tell you IUD about IUDs? Um, it doesn't allow for the patient to determine and share her values and preferences. So um, I think this is a very common question that we get, and I get this all the time. But well, I'm not really sure between the Depo shot and the next one on. What would you choose? And I would say, you know, this is not my uterus. This is not my um, birth control. So I want to help you decide what's best. What's concerning you about either of these methods, or what is most interesting to you about either of these methods? And it helps to make a better decision. Go ahead, next slide. Tier based counseling is based on presenting contraceptive options by groups based on effectiveness. Recommended in the CDC and the WHO, um, it talks about the benefits and it provides a visual example of how to compare benefits and how to compare effectiveness. And the drawback is that if you don't use it too carefully, then it could be direct, directive or coercive um, because it kind of puts um, the message into a tier, and I'll show you in a second. Um, because it assumes that avoiding pregnancy is the most common priority for the patient. And so, as we know, that's not always true. And so, sometimes if you're not good at using this tool, it can seem like the top tier is what patients sh should choose when they could really choose anything that they want. Next slide. So, this slide presents a comparison of the typical effectiveness of contraceptive methods adapted from the WHO chart comparing effectiveness of family planning methods. There's a couple of other versions of this. Bedsider has a version of this, and Planned Parenthood have, has a version of this too. Um, but they call, I think Planned Parenthood calls it the star chart. Um, so it'll put five stars for the most effective methods and then three or two stars for the least effective methods. So um, you can see the top tier methods are the IUD, implant, vasectomy, and sterilization because there's less than one pregnancy per 100 women per year with these methods. So those are kind of at the top. And you could see how if a patient looked at this um, and uh, they didn't understand the chart or um, avoiding pregnancy wasn't the most important thing for them in a method, that this might seem directed to them and they might feel like they had to choose an IUD or an implant when maybe they might want to choose something different for the symptoms they want to alleviate. Next slide. So pregnancy prevention counseling um, is important to start, um, you know, before the onset of sexual activity if, if at all possible, because we want to talk to people before they're sexually active to decide, you know, what are they wanting in a contraceptive method? Are they seeking to avoid unintended pregnancy? Are they seeking to avoid um, exposure to STDs or STIs um, or preventing those things? And also talking about, you know, um, abstinence is the most effective to way, way to prevent STIs and pregnancy and talking about all the different methods so the person can make a choice and not feel pressured. Um, so having these conversations before in initiating sexual intercourse, um, if they're having, you know, uh, penis and vagina sex and are at risk for pregnancy or STDs, um, then it's important for us to talk to people about that before they start doing things that um, could put them at risk for unintended pregnancy. Next slide. So we want to make sure that we talk to women um, of childbearing age also, um, edu educate them about teratogens um, in early pregnancies. So talking to people before they get pregnant about the medications they take or um, drinking things like alcohol or using other drugs, um, screening for risk behaviors such as um, HIV or other STDs and uh, binge drinking. Um, and then uh, talking about preconception counseling. So reminding that taking prenatal vitamins before you start to get try to get pregnant is the best, that you can have some of that folic acid and other vitamins on board and you can have you know development of a healthy fetus. And so those things are great to talk about in some preconception counseling as well. Next slide. So here are some different ways to present some data. We talked about a lot of different things, not only about the risks, but also some preconception counseling and you know some of the things that people should be thinking about or worrying about in their visit. So um, there are some ways to describe this data and so that you can make it more understandable for your patients in front of you. So things like um, you could use uh, specific things like three out of 10 women develop nausea or a 30% chance of having nausea. Those are pretty understandable uh, statistics. 
but um, changing the denominator, changing the, the number to something very big can be confusing. The so next slide, you can see, for example, you don't want to say something like headache develops in one out of every 333 women because that's really confusing. And using denominators that are common like a 10, 100, or 1,000 are much easier for people to understand. Next slide. So for conditions with a low rate in the baseline population, relative risk alone may exaggerate the hazard. So like I was telling you before, um, way at the beginning of this conversation, if you say something like 350% more dangerous or 2.5 fold risk, um, those things can sound really scary. Whereas if you simplify it and say, for example, heart attacks occur in 4.2 out of every 1 million oral contraceptive users and 1.7 out of every 1 million non-users. So the risk of having a heart attack is 4.2 versus 1.7 out of a million. That can sound a lot less scary than 2.5 fold increase. Next slide. Also remembering that you wanna make sure that you talk to patients and you give them some hands-on tools to touch. Um, being able to see the size of a Nuva ring or the size of an Exelon, the size of an IUD can really decrease fear and help under, women understand what's actually going to be used, and that can make them help may help them make a better decision. Next slide. Also, I think of course there's um, lots of technology out there, and a lot of people are on their phones or on their internet and trying to figure out what's best for them to use. Um, so there's a lot of evidence-based um, kind of method match um, apps out there or other uh, websites. So ARHP has a great one where people can click on things that they're interested in. On the left-hand side, they'll say, I want it to be discreet, I don't want to get an STD, and I want it to be easy to use. And you click on those click boxes and it'll give you condoms. Um, and so then it'll help you choose what method might work best for you. So it's a really nice one. Go ahead, next slide. There's also apps that can help provide women with information and clarify their preference and values. So Bedsider has a really good um, uh, method explore as well as RHAT, which is RAP. Um, and Bedsider, I also like them because if you download their app on the phone, it'll also send you reminders every day to remind you, or every week or every month, to remind you about uh, taking your pill, patch, or ring, or reminding you to go to get your depot shot. Um, so those are nice to put in the phone for those of people who are attached to their phones at the hip um, to help them remember the method that they have chosen. Next slide. Although the risks associated with contraceptives have not changed appreciably over the last decade, the perception of risk by patients and providers has shifted. Um, in other words, the numbers really haven't changed, but the way the numbers are being presented or used has changed. And this change has been driven less by new information um, and more about um, kind of shifting the statistics to make them sound maybe scarier than they are. Um, and so there's also a ton of information out there through media, friends, the internet, other sources. And so people are getting barraged with those new information and you'll find patients might come in and say, I'm on the pill, but man, I'm really worried this new thing came out and it says I shouldn't be taking the pill or should I stop my patch? They told me I should stop it because I might get cancer or something like that. So you might hear those kind of things um, in the office. So um, it's really important to acknowledge a woman's concerns about her health and denying anything that they've heard outright may prevent her from sharing important information in the future. So you want to make sure that you kind of tread a, you know, a middle course there. That way you're not kind of um, pushing her out and saying, oh, no, that was stupid that you're thinking that you should stop. And right now just keep doing your pill. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you support her and understand, acknowledge that she's coming from a place of being really nervous. Um, and then re review the report and the gaps with her. So use simple language. Um, and direct her to credible sources if you feel like that information is not correct. Next slide. So here's a case study from a news frenzy that may lead to questions from your patients. And this is really recent. Um, and I started getting questions about this last year. So this landmark study said that birth control is associated with depression and was broadly featured in the news media and quickly made its way to social media. And everybody that was on the pill really started freaking out and coming in and saying, oh my gosh, am I gonna get depression? Next slide. This prospective cohort study evaluated more than a million Danish women in a study between the ages of 14 and 55. They analyzed the hormonal contraceptive use and subsequent depression based on diagnosis of depression or a receipt, uh, a receipt of a prescription for antidepressants. So they either saw 
is this person diagnosed as having depression or did they pick up some medications like Zoloft or something, you know, SSRIs that might be used to treat depression? Next slide. The study found that overall the incidence of antidepressant prescriptions increased from 1.7 to 2.2 per 100 persons. This is the absolute risk. So you can see that 1.7 to 2.2 is not a very big jump. But the relative risk of birth control was 1.23. The relative risk increased for certain subpopulations, such as adolescents, to 1.8, users of the ring to 1.6, and users of the levonorgestrel IUD to 1.4. So instead of 1.23, it was adolescents 1.8, the ring 1.6, and the IUD, uh, hormonal IUD is 1.4. As discussed earlier, it's important to look at both the absolute risk and the relative risk, because you can see if we told people absolute risk of increasing is very, very small, I don't think people would worry as much about this. Next slide. So there are several limitations in the study. First, they looked at women that were initiating new types of birth control, so there may have been some bias because the women might have initiated a new type of contraceptive as they started feeling poorly. The study did not take into account previous depression, relationship status, and overall life satisfaction. Many co-founders are difficult to tease out in these type of studies, um, and they may overlap with lots of new other events, like new relationships, new children, or new sexual practices. Overall, it's important to acknowledge that birth control has less risk than, than has less risk than benefits. And um, if you're, you know, talking to them, don't lecture them, but talk to them about what they're worried about and say, hey, are you worried that you're getting depressed? And let's talk about your risk factors for that. Next slide. If a patient asks you about something they've seen on the news, listen and acknowledge their concerns, discuss the risks as a broad literature has, as, as literature has defined them. And if you're familiar with a particular report, um, talk about the limitations of the study or um, may, maybe ways that you think the study wasn't helpful or maybe ways that might scare the patient more than what they are uh, uh, on the media than what is actually true. Next slide. So let's talk a very quickly in five minutes about a case presentation for Vanessa. So Vanessa is a healthy 26-year-old African-American woman. Um, she takes no medications aside from her Yasmin pills. She is heterosexual with four previous male partners and a new partner for two months. She has two previous abortions, and when asked, she reports she would typically miss two or three pills per month and for this reason, Vanessa is looking to switch from the pill to something else. So you wanna think about what would you talk to her about? So the first step is to ask her, what's most important in a birth control method for you? Or do you wanna become pregnant in the next year? And Vanessa tells you that preventing pregnancy is her number one goal, but she would also like a lighter period if that's possible. So you could use the cheer-based tool, that chart that I showed you, um, and you explain to Vanessa that long-acting reversible contraceptives are the most effective options that would prevent pregnancy the best, um, and that these are also good candidates um, because they, she doesn't have to remember them every day. She expresses some interest in the LARP, so you show her a hands-on model of an implant and an IUD so she can see how big they are and understand where they are in her body. Next slide. So Vanessa's mother has breast cancer, and Vanessa indicates that she has heard some types of birth control cause cancer. You begin by explaining that this may be true, although the evidence is inconsistent. And you explain, while there may be a modest increased risk in breast cancer, recent studies have indicated that increase in risk is very low. Additionally, when you stop taking birth control, the risk goes away. You explain that most hormonal contraceptives carry a similar risk, but some evidence has indicated that progestin-only implant does not increase the risk of breast cancer. Um, but there's not a ton of evidence, so it's a little bit hard for you to weigh on very specifically. You talk about the overall birth control effect, um, the net negative effect on cancer, and um, let her touch it, and Vanessa decides on getting the arm implant, the next salon. Next slide. So you let her know also that the most common side effect of the arm implant is abnormal irregular bleeding, and you discuss um, that she may experience irregular bleeding for the first three to six months or longer. Um, and if those are methods that, or are those are side effects that she doesn't enjoy, um, that it's okay to stop using that method if she wants to and she can come back and talk to you if she needs to. So Vanessa comes back to the clinic after eight months because she's still having irregular regular bleeding. And um, you talk about, is she possibly pregnant? Does she have an STD? Is there any other thing that could be wrong? And those things are excluded. So you explain that the breakthrough bleeding is normal and it may still resolve, but it could also not resolve. 
And so you could ask her, how much is this bleeding bothering you? Um, she would say, oh, well, it's really bugging me a lot, or um, it's not that bad, it's just annoying. And so that's what she says, it's just a little annoying. And so you talk to her about some things that you could do, like either try a different method, or you could give her some combined pills for a month or two to help her with the bleeding. And she decides to try the pill because she still wants the benefit of the birth control from the next full mom. Next slide. Whew, I did it. So, um, <laughs> so you can see that there's a lot to talk about, of course, and I'm sorry I had to fly through that so quickly. Um, but please type any questions that you may have into the question box um, so we can see if there's anything there. I'm so sorry again about being so rushed. Hi everyone, we're gonna do one question and I'm gonna save these and make sure that we address them at the next webinar, um, November 17th. So let's go with the first one. How can we best answer the question of risk as it relates to mortality for COC users versus non-users? So um, I think the best way to address that is to say, um, there are a few risks that you have when you take a combined oral contraceptive that are different than if you're not taking uh, the pill. So the most um, probably common risk that you might have heard about is blood clots. And so in the study showing the risk of people that use birth control versus people that don't use birth control, we see that people that use birth control, um, 6.7 out of 1,000, I'm sorry, out of 100,000 women would get a blood clot versus 1.7 out of 100,000 women that don't use birth control. So the risk is still really low, and it's a really safe method, um, but let's talk about if that risk sounds too, uh, is, is, too, um, is too much for you. Is that something that you're willing to take on, or would you like to talk about a different method? Okay, um, I think we can do one more, Jackie. Please define high estrogen pills. Oh yeah, so um, the high estrogen is uh, 30 to 40 micrograms of estrogen versus the 20 microgram of estrogen, which is considered low. All right, so thank you, Jackie. That was great, we really appreciate it, and thanks for going and flying through it in our limited amount of time. Um, we will capture the rest of the questions and make sure that we make time for them on the 17th. And for now, um, before you exit this webinar, please note the following. Be sure to visit ahb.org to view two clinical minutes and register for the second web webinar, which will be um, next month. We'll send you an email with all the information. It's going to be communicating contraceptive risk in special populations. As a reminder, you will see, soon receive an email from ARHP's education department containing a link to the post survey. Your CME or CE certificate will be generated at the end of the survey. Please be sure to print the certificate before closing the internet browser. If you have any questions, always email us to education at arhp.org. Thank you for your time and for viewing this webinar. It will be available online um, and by next week, so if you want to review it, you can do that as well, and the entire deck will be posted to CORE in a month. So thank you.